Lamy Apato is the founder of Journify, the audio-first app designed for millennials. The app allows users to record voice notes on the go, organize them with tags and comments, and track their burnout score. Hi, Tony Hackett is my name, and I am your host at the Startups Roundtable. Already, 7 in 10 millennials are suffering from burnout, and the World Health Organization estimates this is costing companies a total of $550 billion in productivity losses. This is a problem needing to be solved. So let's meet Lamia as she takes us inside the Journify evolution and shares data that is shaping their go-to-market. So my name is Lamia. I'm the founder of Journify, and I've been building this company slash my baby um, for the last year. At the beginning, it was all about research, testing. We launched a pilot, we, we killed it. And then recently launched the audio journaling app a few weeks ago. So it's been quite a ride. Um, but now we have, you know, real users. We have real feedback, people recording their days on the app. It's been really cool. And uh, if you think about the, the mental health space, I think that where we lie is very much on, on the left side of the spectrum, which is all mental wellness, mental health prevention, not addressing mental health illnesses. So we've spent so much of our time researching burnout and understanding the consequences of burnout, the um, factors that lead to burnout and symptoms, because it is a type of diagnosis that is very new. It was declared a legitimate workplace-related diagnosis by the World Health Organization only in May of 2019, so fairly recent. And because of that, there's been a wave of legitimizing and researching the topic by, you know, researchers, people in HR, and just professionals in, in different fields. And because of that, we were very interested. It, it, it's like relatively new, but it's impacting, you know, many of us. So seven in 10 millennials are suffering from some level of burnout. And that doesn't even include, you know, different levels of chronic stress, starting to develop symptoms of anxiety. And we think that we need to start incorporating mental wellness into our lifestyle, into what we do every day, into the way we, you know, interact with our phones, uh, people, et cetera. We need to start thinking about it and not as a side thing that is a chore almost like we're too busy. We don't have time to do that. No, we have to like do it day by day because otherwise we keep accumulating tension and that really impacts, you know, other areas of our, our of our health. So with that in mind, we researched so many different alternatives that were evidence-based methods that would help reduce tension. And of course, meditation is a really important one, but I think there are many apps that do that and do it really well. And it's very cool. But when I was you know, talking to my friends all the time, everyone's stressed and, you know, someone recommends try meditation and a lot of people are not, you know, natural with that. They don't love to meditate and that's okay. But what are other alternatives? So I think that for, for those seven in 10 millennials, Journify exists and audio journaling is one of the tools that we are focusing on for now. We are voice first because we do everything based on voice first nowadays. We consume our content listening to podcasts. So why would it be any different when we commute? You know, why do we have to like type so much and get more carpet tunnel? Uh, <laughs> better to just do it through voice. So audio journaling is the first, you know, step in our journey. We also have some mental wellness tracking features in the app as well. But we plan on making that way more robust um, in the future. When I first saw what you were doing, I was surprised because I, I didn't even know such a thing could exist. I understood the journaling, understood the importance of mental health, but the fact that you brought it together. There are so many elements of what you've just gone through in the last couple of minutes introducing that warrant a, a podcast on its own. I'm going to go back to almost the first thing that you said, and that is your baby and your business. Was it your passion before it was a business or you started to look at it as a business and then it became the passion? How did that sequence of events happen? So I've always been passionate about entrepreneurship. So I started my career in marketing, working in advertising, and I loved it. But then about nine years ago, I started my first startup job. I was right out of grad school and I was deciding between consulting and startup. That was like one night where I had to make a decision. 
And, you know, I was like, I want to do the crazy thing because I have nothing to lose, you know? And then I immediately fell in love with it. I felt like it was such a good fit for me. And I just have that addiction to performance adrenaline. So I loved it. But my whole career in startup work world has always been fintech, mainly some e-commerce, but mainly fintech. So it's just been interesting because for me, it's been a whole new industry, you know, whereas most people have to adapt to learning how to launch a business or build a brand or work, you know, on with tech, build products. For me, all of that was intuitive. I had a lot of experience doing that. But mental wellness was an area that was completely new to me. I was just like very curious and interested from a personal perspective. And at first I had a little bit of imposter syndrome, you know, and I took the the science of well-being course by Professor Santos at at Yale. And she starts the course by saying that the reason why she created is because she needed it for herself. Although she was a professor in cognitive psychology already, she didn't understand how to actually be happy here. She wasn't taking the course because she was the happiest. So I thought that's an interesting, you know, perspective. I don't pretend that I have it all figured out when it comes to mental wellness, but it's something that I'm very interested in. And I don't suffer from a specific mental health illness. And I'm grateful for that. And I feel that we still have to do, you know, so much prevention because it could just happen to anyone at any point in time. So if you can prevent some of that, why not? And I think that connecting all those dots together is how I came about this. But at the beginning, Journify was a concept, you know, it was it was an, a discovery of the space and the opportunity and how the brain hacking trend was growing. And of course, now because of COVID is growing even faster, but even last year, it was already happening. So many of my friends talking about life coaching and different techniques for reducing stress. So that was already there. And I, and I was very interested in that, but I didn't really have an idea. Uh, of the product. It wasn't like very specific. And we even piloted a different product first that then we killed and then came with a new one. So I'm not too focused on on what specific product features are. I'll, I'll let customers decide what that is. But I'm not going to lie after using Journify for quite a bit. I haven't checked actually, but I'm probably the customer with the most engagement in the platform. I use it all the time. And now that we are testing transcript services, I'm even using it for way more things. I even use it today to just create my grocery shopping list. <laughs> then got it transcripted and on my way to the store, you know? So I'm obsessed with it now because I love it. But before it was just like an obsession with, with a space. I must say when we'd set up this time and I'd started to research what you're doing, I downloaded the app and I've been using it and I find the simplicity of it is fantastic. And I mean that in a complimentary way. And like you, I'm I'm a huge fan of audio and I'm a big user of audio, which might sound a little bit crazy to be saying that as we're speaking on a podcast, but I, I use it in my work every single day. And whether it's voice to text or whether it's using recording, it almost feels to me like it's the unpolished gem of productivity that at one time will have its day and it's soon approaching. I agree with that, though. And the way I think about it is even if you're not interested in mental wellness, you still get the benefits of it just by using it. But there's so many different use cases and we're not even promoting that. Our users are telling us what they're using it for. Some people are actually using it to record their podcasts. So they record things on the go because there are podcasts that are more about their lifestyle. Some entrepreneurs are using it to document their journey. Some writers are using that to record their ideas. We even had a working mom the other day that said, this is great because I put the phone on top of the stroller. With the other hand, I have to hold my dog when we go on walks. So then I just can just talk to the phone and I don't feel like my time is completely wasted. So it's definitely productivity related. It's just that the mental wellness benefits comes on top of that too. It's an ability for each of us to maintain a pulse of our own well-being as well, as well as getting feedback from the platform. You spoke about millennials and you understand that as a sector. That's your main focus right now? I would say yes, but specifically the type of um, millennials that have a really busy life that really don't have time for anything else in their busy schedules. And maybe they have five minutes here and there. Maybe they have like 20 minutes when they're commuting. And those are the times when 
you know, you could just incorporate all your journaling easily. Now, we've actually had an interesting mix of a user we're based coming to use our platform. We are not alienating different segments, but we talked to over 100 millennials to build the platform. You know, that's how we came about the user experience. So I think that that's why it's the more intuitive for us. And the one thing I would say I'm very proud of is most of the mental health companies and startups and platforms and even nonprofits, they always tell us that their user base is predominantly female. And for us, it's it's very, you know, even female, male. So we we wanted to understand that a bit more. And we've heard comments like, we don't feel like it, the platform, you know, is pink, like other platforms are and like very like, you know, soft pastel colors. And honestly, soft pastel colors are for everyone, you know. But I think that when it comes to specific type of platforms, it comes with some associations. And some people feel that that means that it's very like presumptuous or like, yes, you can do this today. And, you know, very like cheerful. And some people just don't adapt to that. So that's why we've actually been very careful with providing the user experience and then having information and audio experiences that are helpful and that provide value, but without getting into the motivational space. The world that we live in right now with remote working and the like, it provides a different level of benefit from Journify, in my opinion. And that is when we're in a workplace and we're walking past somebody and we get to know them and we pick up physical cues, it is a challenge to try and pick up those physical cues or to work out what's real and what's not on a 30 minute video call. And it's almost like we're auditioning every time there's a video call, we're up for the video call because we need to be. But who knows what happens after the video call finishes? And it's it's a pretty high certainty that the world that we're living in, the way our work life is structured right now and social life is going to come more face to face, but there's going to be an increased level of remoteness, arguably forever, which means that what you're doing and what you're you're setting out to do, if it was important when you started, it feels to me like it's even more important now. And organizations need to be thinking about how they help people maintain a check on their own well-being, as well as have the, the corporate responsibility. And it'd be interesting to get your thought on that and how this, this remoteness that we're living in right now makes you think differently or harder about what you're doing. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. So it's changed a few things for us. First, I'll address the, the some of the findings. We've been collaborating with um, Team Blind to run some surveys of working professionals that now are forced to be remote. So the levels of burnout have increased drastically, anxiety, depression, and beyond our own set of surveys, there are you know, other data points. You go and look at Google Trends, for example, and you just type in anxiety. And for the last eight weeks, the curve just keeps going up. So the fact that mental well-being is becoming more predominant, absolutely. We're also seeing it in the, the amount of leads that we get and people's interest in our product. So that's definitely happening. And I think that once people get used to thinking about their mental well-being, it's going to become more of a habit, you know, because right now we think about our lifestyle and we think we exercise, we eat healthier, we hydrate ourselves. But then it's mental health or not. It's very binary. Are you mentally ill or not? What we are trying to do, and hopefully it's a trend that's brewing, and it's just by us, that you start thinking about relaxing, you know, at the same level of importance as you think about those other physical wellness type of lifestyle adjustments. This has been accelerated for sure. And we hope that products like ours actually become part of everyone's daily lives. Then from a company perspective, I think that you know, we will have to learn how to work in this new environment. And I think leaders are also burning out because they are, you know, responsible for poor organizational design and all the different fa factors that lead to burnout. They're also burning out because of the added responsibility. They are also victims of the same system. And I think that before that was already a problem with that, but now it's even worse. And as much as people say, Working from home has so many benefits because so many people wanted it before and they couldn't. I agree. I think there are so many benefits, but I don't think that the model we have right now works. That part we, we're not focusing on where it's like, you know, tools for remote work. I think that there are companies that are already working to solve that problem, but something has to happen because I agree with you. It's so much pressure to just be phone call after phone call, and it's all video without the little breaks, you know, without running into each other 
um, in the hallway without the, the five minute random conversation that you have when the meeting ends and those little moments that help you actually get to know the other person a lot better because of something random they said about the weekend because of a random gesture. Maybe you even learn what they eat because they, they start eating something and, and just little things that really get help you to get to know someone. We don't have that anymore. The call ends and we go like, okay, bye. That definitely has to change because otherwise tools and specialties are not going to be enough to actually prevent the mental health crisis that, that is also happening. We have a report actually coming out next week. So actually I'll share that with you as well. But essentially you look at the stats, they're really scary and it's almost like a whole new, you know, pandemic that's happening on its own. And I join virtual summits all the time and I talk to other mental health specialists and nonprofits have been focusing a lot on research over the last several months. And, you know, there's been tons of grants and funding to support that process. And uh, yeah, everyone is talking about this crisis. Everyone's scared, but everyone's feeling a bit paralyzed as well because there, there doesn't seem to be a solution. And part of the paralysis also comes from the fact that so much of this is driven by culture, you know, and dynamics, all of that that happens in the workplace because that's where we spend or where, <laughs> you know, quote unquote, how we spend so many hours of the day. We are definitely interested on in exploring the angle to work with companies because there's definitely a benefit of, for example, companies can provide this to their employees. They can audio journal. They can, you know, use that to, to release some tension privately, of course, but then they can also track their burnout levels. One of the problems as well is that some employees don't know how to address that with their bosses. We have been trying to do some video series for that to help out. But one of the actions that are like the most impactful is data. Just take the test, bring it to your employer, read about it, and then educate it. Maybe your boss doesn't know about burnout. Maybe they know, but they also don't know what to do about it. So I believe that if we all focus a bit more on education as well, we are going to go a long way. You provide some very interesting indicators on your website, and there was one that really caught my attention, and you just reminded me of it as you spoke, and it was being able to bring out the, the language that is being used across teams. So anonymized, but being able to actually highlight what the, the sentiment is, and I think there's something very powerful about language and how it's used. At a simple level, to explain one way that I approach this is, if I'm researching a company, I'll take their annual report. I'll capture all of the text and I'll create a word cloud through a tool and I'll take it down to the 20 words and I'll compare companies versus each other in exactly that same way. And the message that comes out in that curated list as to the true language that's being used. And some companies, the biggest word in the middle of the top 20 out of a 70,000 word document is customer and others it's cost and others it's growth. And so when I saw, and maybe I could ask you to speak to the example that I saw on your site, but when I saw that, I thought that was so powerful. To your point, managers who want to help and employees who want to be open to the help, but people that the employee and the employer, the manager don't know how to connect that intent. I thought there's something just great about what you're doing. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, what's interesting also in so many situations, the, the manager also wants to talk to their manager and so on and so on. The, the fact that this is a really widespread problem, it makes it be a unanimous thing you know, across the company and the companies that have worse organizational design or worse hiring practices or like people that get promoted too quickly and then they don't have the um, training required to do so or people that constantly promote people without hiring replacements, et cetera. So it's just more than working many hours. So people burn out all the time, even working nine to five or less than that. It's just about, is this a good fit? Do you have the skills to do this? Do you have a good environment? Is this where you're motivated, et cetera, and a whole set of factors. So the cool thing about bringing something like Journify to, to your workplace and say, hey, here's an app where you can track your burnout levels. You're already going a long way because you're legitimizing the fact that first you talk about burnout. Second of all, you're providing a tool for them to measure. You're not scared of your employees measuring their own burnout level over time because it's also proven that once you are aware of your own stress levels, burnout levels, lack of sleep, whatever that may be, 
you immediately start turning it around. At least you try to make those lifestyle adjustments. But if you don't actually see it or hear it, you you kind of like leave it in the back of your mind, but you don't like take action over that. What you're doing also, when I look at it, is you're giving the opportunity for sustainable change. I'll give an example of my context. My employer had said and designed that everyone in the company would take a week off during July. When that was announced, I thought that was being pushed on us. I thought, I don't need a break. Good idea, but I don't need it. And the company contributed a day of the week and everybody needs to take four days from their annual leave. At the end of that week, and I can remember almost verbatim having my weekly call with my manager and said, you know, how was the week? I said, well, if it was up to me, I wouldn't have taken it. And it wasn't a holiday because I didn't use the time like I would as a holiday. But I did this on one day and this on another day. And there were three days when I didn't really do a whole lot. And I said, I am so glad I had the break and I feel so much better for it. But I wouldn't have done it on my own. And that was an event, though. What you offer and what you provide is Jernify is able to then create a rhythm to the life of being able to maintain that mental agility and health and your own personal sounding board, keep your own pulse. If you and I are having a meal right now, we go to a very good restaurant, we have a very nice salad, that's the event. But then how do I make that dietary change? Because there's no way to do the quick look at somebody. If I'm bloodshot eyes and coughing, we know that I'm not well. But to look at somebody on that call, that 30 minute, there's no way to pick it up in that moment. So Jernify's role and the potential, I guess, when I look at it, is immense from how do we just become better ourselves and feel better in our own skin each day. Hopefully that, you know, is is the case when people start using it after a few days. I think the first day takes a little bit of adjustment for some people. Some people are just natural. They just like go and do it. Some people start curating themselves a bit and they don't just like speak their mind for the first few minutes. And then you start kind of like going. And that's what we call finding your journaling style. There's actually a really interesting report on the New York Times that specifically addresses the importance of finding your journaling style. And that was very much focused on written journaling because that was from a few years ago. But if you think about audio journaling, it's the same thing. What we actually always recommend is go speak your mind. Then you're going to find your style. We even have a workshop for audio journaling. We talk about CBT techniques. We talk about gratitude journaling. We talk about journaling for creatives. We talk about journaling for, for lazy. <laughs> and, and there's just like so many different ways. And the cool thing is that so many people on my team have very different journaling styles between them. And then I also have a very different style than theirs. What's cool about it is then you find your own and then you can actually like keep going. You find your moment, you, you find your, your style, and then it becomes a habit. And when it does, then you start to feel like, oh, that was great. That was actually so easy. And I actually feel like more relaxed and it's very good to do in your commute because you never want to go too stressed. You don't want to be too stressed when you get home to your roommates, to your partners, to your family. So it's better to calm down a bit, then get home. And once you start seeing those benefits, you actually start doing it more often. So the consistency is important, but also consistency depends on what we prefer. You know, some people do it like once a week and that's kind of like their way of like wrapping up the week. That's okay as well. It, it depends when you find the time, when you want it. Some people do it based on triggers. And if it's based on a trigger, then it's better to do it, you know, in the moment. And I think for employers, besides the fact that you have a bit more of a relaxed you know, group of employees, the other benefit is you actually help them improve communication skills. So it's also a very helpful thing, which is kind of like a side benefit, not necessarily related to, to mental wellness. But when you start audio journaling often, then you start controlling your tone of your voice a bit better. The other benefit is you actually communicate your ideas ideas with other people a bit better because most of the time what happens is we're thinking, thinking, thinking like a million miles per hour. And then the first time we talk about them, it's actually already in front of an audience, in front of someone else, in front of a team, whoever that may be. So the good thing about this is that once your ideas are very raw, they're just like coming out to your mind. So you already start formulating your thought process and how you actually sell that story a bit better. This has been such an engaging conversation and I wonder if we could pick it up on another 
time to go further with it. There's so much more to cover. But in closing today, could I ask you to make a comment or to share your thoughts around coaches and mentors for startups that if someone was listening to this, if they were looking for some guidance as to how they might think about finding a coach or a mentor, what would you say to them? That's actually a very good question because I feel that finding a mentor is really, really important. I've had different ones at different points in my life, but when I have gaps, I notice that it's you know, important for me to like try to find a new one. But it always depends also on what is your priority at the moment. I think that in my last few years of being a mentor as well through some networks, I believe that the best way is to just do a bunch of outreach as much as possible, meet a, meet a lot of people, network without asking anyone to be your mentor, without asking anyone to dedicate a specific amount of time, I feel it's important to first meet people and see who you have actual, an actual chemistry with, who actually provides you with advice and guidance that actually helps you, that you respect, that matters to you. And then over time, you can build a you know mentorship relationship, whether if it's formal or informal, it sort of like develops naturally over time. But I think that what a lot of people do is they just like post on a group, you know, I'm looking for a mentor, whatever. And then someone recommends someone else because, oh, they have a flashy title and they did something like incredible cool or because or maybe some someone that is a professional coach i think that it's important to still do that talk to everyone but cast a very wide net and then through that process find whoever feels like okay that that's kind of like a match it's like finding a co-founder there has to be that chemistry there has to be that respect and trust in the relationship and i think it varies also depending on like depending on what you're going through for example for me right now i don't care about talking to someone that is already a unicorn and built something that is, you know, massive. I care more about talking to entrepreneurs that are more advanced than me, but not too far advanced where they kind of like forgot a bit. I'm also not interested in talking to entrepreneurs that have an incredible network and tons of funding from the beginning. No, I rather talk to the ones that bootstrap that had a really hard journey and did the right things and are still, you know, running their business and they went through some hardships, but they are in a very good place right now and they're successful. So that's the kind of profile that matters for me. But I've identified that through talking to a lot of people, through meeting so many. And sometimes I prefer to also talk to different entrepreneurs and then form my own opinions. So if I have a challenge, I would reach out to several ones on LinkedIn. And I think a lot of people respond. You know, I think that entrepreneurs that have gone through the same process, they understand and they're also willing to help and give back. So then I actually talk to several and with some, I form really good connections. So then I kind of like go back to them when something else happens or I give them updates, you know, a few weeks later and we just build relationships like that. That's a very generous answer with a, a lot of experience poured into it. So thank you. It's been a delight speaking with you today and, and hearing about what you're doing in the Genify story. It will be fantastic to stay in touch and I'd, I'd love to speak in the near future and, and see how the progress is charting. So Lamia, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today. What a big problem that Genify is tackling. And I appreciate the great knowledge and experience shared by Lamia Pardo. But that's it for today. Feedback is always appreciated. Thank you and bye for now.